Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the uh, delayed start of the Identity Governance and Administration track. Uh, apologize our first speaker, Tim Callahan, who is the CISO for AFLAC, uh, became ill and was unable to make the flight out. I did get access to his slides. We will be posting those, so at least that information will be available to you to download. Um, but while we only have one less session, no less amount of information that we want to share with you this afternoon, uh, my name is Kurt Johnson. I'm the Vice President of Strategy and Corporate Development for Corion Corporation. Uh, we are a provider of identity and access management solutions focused on user provisioning and governance, as well as real-time identity and access analytics and monitoring. And my goal today is share with you a little bit about this notion of identity therapy. And you know, how do we survive in this era with this explosion of more users and data and devices and identities that we need to manage? Um, and it's a consistent problem that we're seeing within our customer base. And again, if you want to learn more about Curion and what we do, we have a booth out there. I'm not going to be going into a, a lot of Curion uh, pitch here. But the quick spiel is, you know, we say our mission is to help customers succeed in this world of open access and increasing threats. And we know it's a business driver and initiative to make more data available to a broader variety of individuals out there. And we need to support the business in that initiative. But we also walk into it understanding that there's risks associated with that. And so what the goal is, is how do we ensure that we're getting the right access to the right group of individuals to the right set of resources and ensuring they're doing the right things with it. And really that's kind of the focus of what my company is all about and the things that we're dealing with within our customer base. And we've seen a lot of change from that over the years. You know, what really started with was with helping people deal with the administration burden of making sure that the right people get the right access, evolved into a compliance and audit issue that we needed to get through that audit process a little bit cleaner and a little bit easier. But today, we're continuing to see that evolve. And I would argue that to truly survive in this era the therapy really gets to an understanding of where risk is associated in this. I mean, risk is clearly on the minds of the boards of directors and the senior executives in our organization. Whether it's financial risk, reputational risk, compliance risk, and increasingly more and more IT and security risk, they're talking about these things. They need a better understanding of it. And I think the ripple effect that we're seeing from cybersecurity risk to the broader array of other risks in the organization is more prevalent than ever before. And we don't have to look too far to see a perfect example of this with the recent Target breach. And I don't know what you're saying. Not even two minutes into the session, he's already brought up Target. Does it every security presentation have to mention Target? It is a requirement nowadays. But I do think it's also a great illustration of exactly what this principle is and what the impact it has to the organization. You know, we're all familiar with the breach, took place over the Christmas season and immediately became headline material, where every so-called pundit was talking about what it meant and putting more fear and uncertainty into the minds of consumers where hundreds of millions of people's personal information and credit card data was out there. It became the butt of jokes of satirical cartoonists where they were writing about this because it was in the papers every day. I'm not a brand expert, but I'm fairly certain that's not where you want to see your company's brand in a satirical cartoon talking about the breach. And it did force their CEO to make a very public statement about what this meant, that they recognized and identified this breach, they've taken care of it to contain it, and really the importance to reach out to the customers to try to regain their trust because this clearly had a significant impact in the mind of the consumers and clearly had an impact on that reputational risk. There is a website out there called yougov.com that actually tracks something called the buzz score. And it basically rates the uh, consumer and the customer mindset of various brands. And that red squiggly line was Target's brand reputation over time, compared to the gray line, which was large retailers in an industry as a whole. So one thing Target was very proud of was the fact that their brand reputation exceeded that of the industry on a consistent basis. Right around this last holiday season, they went on a major advertising campaign and you saw a very significant spike in their buzz score. Anything above 30 is some of the top, most favored brands out there. Then the breach occurred. And not only did their buzz score plummet, 
not only did it go below the industry as a whole, anything below the zero line is a negative brand reputation and image. It plummeted to historic lows. I mean, cigarette companies were, had a better reputation than Target after this breach occurred. And so the mindset of the customer and the impact it had on reputational risk was significant. And the financial risk followed a very similar pattern, maybe not quite as dramatic, but the stock price saw a similar fall off as well. And this decline in stock price, very much related to the breach and the incidents following the breach, resulted in billions of dollars of lost market cap to Target. And there were the hard costs associated with it as well, where their earnings report talked about a 46% fall in income because of all the costs associated with dealing with the after effects of this breach. And then there was personal fallout as well, where there needed to be a scapegoat. The CIO was forced to resign shortly after this event. And it didn't stop there, where a couple months later, the CEO was uh, forced to resign as well. And the subtext under this picture actually talks about that the CEO's resignation was the latest in a series of moves by Target as it struggled to recover from this breach. And how did this breach occur? Through an HVAC employee's access. There was an HVAC partner, some company that worked on a lot of the heating and ventilation systems within Target stores that had an account probably to submit invoices and do other types of scheduling and it was that poorly protected credentials that the hackers used to gain access into the target systems to then go out and target the high-valued uh, information that they were after. And it's not just target. You know, we, we've seen this across uh, numerous different industries. This is from the Verizon data breach report this past year where they looked at the sheer number of breaches and broke them into how those breaches occurred. And as you see, malware and social that we hear a lot about are clearly rising. But pure hacking continues to be the most popular form of how breaches occur and rising faster than any other. If you peel the onion back about what constitutes hacking breaches, there's a number of different uh, things such as backdoors and command control, SQL injections, brute force, other types of attacks. But more than 50% of the hacking type of incidents were the use of stolen credentials. People stealing and misusing access and identities to gain access and to cause harm. So with more than 50% of this being associated with this, what are the controls we have in place to protect this? What are we doing to better manage and protect our identities? Well, there's been the historical aspects of provisioning. If we set up accounts appropriately, if we modify and change those accounts, and when we turn them off at the end of the day, there's a preventative control in place there. And what is the underlying control we use to really effectively indicate whether provisioning should or should not occur? It's an approval. And essentially, as long as some manager approves it somewhere, that's really all we need to do to go and set up that account. And we have that record to show that, you know, Kurt approved it on this date, and so it's obviously valid. But, you know, once we started to see more and more regulations and compliance, that wasn't good enough. We needed the detective controls in place as well. So we started to see the emergence of governance initiatives, including the annual or periodic uh, access certification reviews. And how many of you here actually go through a formal access certification review in your organizations? How many of you do it more than three or four times a year? A couple hands, but not too many. And again, what are we relying on here? Some manager's approval or certifi certification saying, you know what, I reviewed all this and it looks good to me. So with these as the primary controls, I'm sure we all have a significant amount of confidence that this is really all we need because we never see this rubber stamping thing take place in our organization, do we? I mean, we never expect that, you know, a manager who's sifting through potentially hundreds of different users and their access, they're taking the time to do this, right? And we, we caught a little hint of this when we introduced our access certification product, and the first feature request we got was, can you add a box to say select all, which was kind of an indicator that we knew exactly what the end users were looking for. In the Verizon data breach report, they kind of sum up the year as a whole in it. In this year, it's 2013 report, they said, you know, this might be remembered as the year of the retailer breach. And it really suggests that they saw this transition from these geopolitical attacks to large-scale attacks on payment card systems. Clearly a significant target within the hacker community. 
And if you look at the regulations in compliance, we actually have a regulation that deals with these payment card systems, right? It's PCI. How many of you deal with PCI audits and cardholder information? Yeah, a good chunk of you, I bet. In this year of the large scale attacks on payment card systems, what would you expect to see with PCI compliance? Probably not such good news, right? Well, the Verizon PCI report actually showed that overall compliance with PCI went from 53% in 2012 to over 85% in 2013. Not only got better, but got better by a lot. And so how can this really you know, gel when we're seeing this significant increase in overall compliance, yet at the same time, large scale attacks as the targets got greater and greater out there? Well, if you peel the onion on this back a little bit, there's requirement eight, which is really the one near and dear to a lot of our customers' hearts that we're talking to around authenticating and identifying access to system components with payment card information. And there were some interesting findings in the report. One, they showed that only 24% of organizations that suffered a breach were actually compliant with this specific requirement at the time of the breach. And interesting, over almost two-thirds of folks failed to restrict each account with access to payment card information to just one user. So a lot of shared accounts, high, very often shared administrative accounts with very high privileges. And one of the uh, more significant forms of attacks came from insiders. And it was interesting that more than half of the insiders that committed IT sabotage were former employees who regained access via backdoors and corporate accounts that were never disabled. So this was really kind of a source of a lot of the attacks on these payment card systems. And it wasn't retail alone. Financial services, very similar findings. This is from a Deloitte report on financial service organizations, and they do a list of about 40 or 50 of the top audit findings. And the top four have been the top four every year they've done that survey. People with too much access, excessive access rights. Developers with access to production systems. Still, like, they created this application, it went live, and they still have access now to real live data the lack of removal of access following a transfer or termination, and then the toxic combinations of access with segregation of duty violations. Not only have these been the top four out of this long list every year they've done the survey, in almost every case they continue to increase, especially that one around the removal of access following transfer or termination. So we're not doing a very good job with a lot of the kind of the findings, and we're seeing more and more attacks occurring and again, in the words of Albert Einstein, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And when we have the primary forms of our controls being provisioning and governance, is it enough in this new era where we're seeing more and more of these types of risks and events occurring? And especially when we do it periodically, once, twice, maybe three or four times a year to do the access certification reviews. Undeniably, we know that a lot can occur between these types of reviews. And it's not getting any easier. You know, we're seeing, in a sense, a perfect storm occurring in this market. I don't know if you remember, about 10 years ago, there was a movie, A Perfect Storm, with uh, Mark Wahlberg and George Clooney, about a real-life event that occurred off the east coast of the uh, United States, where this strange and very unique combination of different atmospheric conditions occurred to create what they called the perfect storm, hard to forecast, Devastating effects on a fishing vessel that was lost, killing the fishermen along with it just because of the magnitude and the surprise of the storm. And in a sense, we're seeing a perfect storm in this strange combination of events occurring in our industry, but unlike a storm that's going to blow through at some point, it continues to grow. And that combination are, is more and more data accessible, more and more very sensitive and personal information and company confidential information, being shared with a broader number of users, accessed via a broader and wider number of devices. And what we've been hearing more and more about is it's not just people with devices accessing this data, it's the devices themselves and the whole internet of things which are causing concern accessing more information. I was having a conversation with the chief security officer of one of our healthcare customers that discovered that their kidney dialysis machines were actually accessing cardholder databases. And really not much of a need for a kidney dialysis machine to get a credit card information, but they saw this as an event occurring and really highlighted the whole importance of what the identity of the Internet of Things means. 
And definitely this is something that Kurion is very focused on as we look at this convergence of identity in the Internet of Things that we're going to be branding more and more. Or maybe not the best branding, we're still working on that. But it definitely highlights more and more that we need to look that identity is coming not just from people and devices, but the devices themselves. So in this era where more and more importance is placed in identity and more complexity, we also know that it's not getting any easier, more and more uh, incidents occurring. This is from a PricewaterhouseCoopers survey showing similar trends that the number of breaches continues to grow. But what's interesting about this one is the number of respondents who said they didn't know how many or what kind of breaches they had went from 9% and doubled to 18%. So even the awareness of what's going on is being missed in many organizations. The Verizon report also shows and tracks a very interesting trend where they look at the amount of time something occurs in days or less. And that top red line is how often does a hacker compromise an organization's data in days or less? And you can see almost 95% of the breaches that they investigated happened very quickly. But that blue line was how fast does an organization discover that that event occurred? And unfortunately, the amount of times it actually occurred in days or less was less than 25%. So that gap is widening. where They're getting in quicker, but it's taking us longer to detect or identify that. And in the case of the payment card breaches, 99% of those breaches were discovered external to the organization, usually by law enforcement or the consumer themselves before the organization recognized or discovered it. So we need to take a more focused area on how do we shift our mindset to look at this and be more aware and uh, understand what's happening. I think Gartner said this well in one of their reports, that we need to shift our security mindset from incident response, response to continuous response, where systems are assumed to be compromised and require continuous monitoring and remediation. And this is true within the world of identity and access as well, where we have to change our thinking from being able to do this just once or twice or three times a year. But we know we just can't burden our managers by doing daily periodic reviews. We need to change to a mindset that looks at a continuous monitoring capability, where we're actually pulling identity intelligence and analyzing that intelligence to understand what it means so we can notify the appropriate people at the right time when an event has occurred and take actions to remediate it that include the removal of access, to push out for stronger forms of authentication where we suspect something is occurring and not wait to the end of the year in our periodic review to do this. This is what we mean by identity intelligence. And I don't mean this kind of intelligence, which has been our traditional approach of just more and more reports. We can't just be spitting out more and more reports and relying on people to sift through all this data to figure out what it means. To truly fill the kind of identity intelligence I'm talking about is a big data exercise. You know, here he goes again. Now there's another big buzzword. He has to talk about big data in the presentation as well. But what is big data? You know, it's defined by what many call the three Vs, volume, velocity, and variety. And I think we can say in the world of identity and access, we have a lot of all of those. With more and more different identities, individuals, hundreds of thousands, even millions of identities, departments, roles, locations, consumers, projects, all of this identity information and more and more policy about what people should or should not be able to access. What data there is, what resources have this information and have this access, and what entitlements and rights do people have to do things with that access. And more and more, looking at what people are actually doing with their access. So we can look at what people are, when people are doing inappropriate things with appropriate access. I think that fills the definition for a lot of volume, changing in the velocity of it all the time with a wide variety of different types of data sets. And we can't just expect people to sift through reports to see trends. We need the analytics to truly look at this real time to understand what's risky and where the threat is, how vulnerable are we to attack there, and what assets is that information contained on. You know, we've got company confidential information sitting on a SharePoint site that the Everyone group has access to because of some nested group three layers down. That's where we want to focus our attention and our analytics. You know, we had a case of a customer recently that went through their periodic access certification review. They had a number of key risk applications, hundreds of thousands of accounts, and they found like five orphan accounts among those hundreds of thousands. 
First time they had no audit findings, they were celebrating, they were incredibly happy with just how well they had maintained their systems. When we ran some of the analytics, we actually found some interesting trends to find out that these orphan accounts were actually high risk applications with some of the highest privileged access to them. They were for employees that never existed in the history of their HR database, and they all happened to be created within an hour of one another. Turned out a rogue admin created this backdoor access to get access to some critical systems and resources, and while they were celebrating their audit review, it turned out to be a major finding. You know, CIO did an article recently that said, how do you present cybersecurity issues to the board? And their advice was to use stories, visual aids, and simple language. So it's like talking to your five-year-old, I guess, when you talk to your board. You know, stories, target, bad, visual aids, here's a picture of what can happen, and simple language, don't want this happening to us. And we saw this when we were doing these certification reviews and we had this laundry list of hundreds of users and thousands of different accounts and entitlements. That didn't really meet this objective. And so when we introduced this new analytics and monitoring, we knew we needed pretty pictures. We needed to show them where that risk was occurring and enabling them the drill down necessary to see what was the root behind that risk. So take that incident I mentioned a little while ago, you know, looking at who a user is and what they have access to, this is what we call our Access Explorer. It allows that drill down capability so I can see who's got access to what and even when they were granted that privileged access through some nested layer a number of layers down. All make it very alive so you can click on that and see those different forms. So again, that incident I mentioned earlier about that customer would have seen a very different thing where a heat map would all of a sudden popped up a high risk thing saying, here's a new account that was created outside the provisioning system, never got any approval, that's a risky event. It's on a high-risk application with a high-risk set of entitlements, and that user doesn't exist anywhere in our database. Do we know who this is? And then when we see another and another, you know, we don't want to wait till the end of the year or the next cycle to do our certification review. This is what we call a micro-certification. So immediately we take that information and send that to the manager to say, hey, this is what we've seen, what do you want to do with this, and immediately disable those accounts and do so in a much more timely fashion. So this analytics can change the whole way we do governance, so if we still have to even do certification reviews, it can be a much cleaner overall process. And we can bring this into the provisioning cycle as well, where as I mentioned today, we rely very heavily to do policy evaluation on an approver. And we expect that they're going to take the time to approve it, and if so, fulfill those requests, or if not, deny them. But understanding that many managers just get bombarded with these, what if we did a real-time analysis of a request and put a risk score on them? You know, this is a low-risk event because, you know, we're applying access for an accounts payable clerk. We're asking for access that every single accounts payable clerk gets. It fits within policy. Let's just fulfill those. Automatically set up that account, send a notification out, and avoid the burden of making somebody have to go and approve that. But where we see something that might be moderate risk, you know, they're asking for some kind of counts that are different than their peer group. Maybe not a huge issue, but you know what? We want the manager to go take a look at that with the context of why we're asking them to approve it to, again, either fulfill or reject that request. And then when we see something high risk, high privileges, high set of entitlements, maybe it's a policy violation like a segregation of duty conflict, again, with that context, send it off to multiple managers to approve before we set up or reject that if it's not appropriate. When we can put that context in there in real time, give them more ability of understanding why we're asking their approver, higher level of understanding what they're looking at, and higher level controls. And I believe we can bring this to the whole notion of role mining too, which we know is a very manual intensive burden process for many organizations to have to go through this ability of mining all of these different roles. Imagine if the analytics could show us these patterns to see where there's like incidents of access and what are the characteristics that designate that commonality. It may not be their job function. It may not be their role, their, you know, department. But here are the things, the characteristics that give that uh, organization an understanding of where those accesses are like. And then we can start to show anomalies. You know, why do we have 30 people in the sales organization, but we have two of them that look more like IT administrators than we do salespeople? You know, maybe they're the Salesforce admin, or maybe they just have more access than they're supposed to have. 
And this is what we really mean by identity intelligence. Having this real-time analytic capability of making risk assessments and analyzing this on a real-time basis to identify risks and vulnerabilities, but also to improve the efficiency on how we deal with governance as well as provisioning. You know, Gartner said their, one of their predictions, you know, the keynote this morning was making fun of their, some of their predictions. They have one around this saying that by 2020, identity analytics and intelligence will deliver direct business value in over 60% in of enterprises, up from less than 5% today. We believe the road to this, we can't wait till 2020. There's more need to take advantage of this identity intelligence and analytics by adding and complementing the aspects of provisioning and governance with real-time monitoring and analytics to take an understanding and view of all this data and information to really understand where are we vulnerable, where are we seeing anomalies to norm, but also to feed that back into our provisioning processes and governance processes to make it easier. This is what we mean by intelligence. This is where we feel we need to move in order to truly manage and understand this explosion of users and the identities and uh, as well as the devices and the information they're gathering it from. It clearly is a security issue. We clearly need to stand up to it. And really, we feel the time is now to start to make this advancement. I appreciate your time and attention. If you have any questions, I'll be hanging around for a little bit after the tracks are over, uh, as well as at our booth later on. And I appreciate your time and attention this afternoon. Now we're going to kind of make the switch. Uh, next up is Darren Rolls, who's the uh, Chief Technology Officer from SailPoint. And he's going to continue this discussion around kind of this ex explosion and evolution, specifically talking about what it means in this hybrid environment of on-premise and cloud. So we'll go make the switch. And Darren? Maybe it's, e Maybe it's easier to do this. <laughs> Just flip this. This is on. Give everybody a few moments to come in, hopefully, and not go out. We'd rather people coming in than going out, but uh, please do come and get yourself comfortable. We'll give folks a second or two to come in. We're doing the real time switch over here, so. Okay, so thanks, Kurt. Yes. My time starts, we have 25 minutes. Uh, as Kurt said, I'm Darren Rolls and I'm the Chief Technology Officer at SailPoint Technologies. Uh, we're obviously a, a vendor in this space. Many of you probably know us from our history of pioneering the identity governance space. And uh, we also provide provisioning, so we are that identity governance and administration title that uh, Gartner uses to really refer to the two coming together. And my title today, I'm obviously here standing in for Guardian Life Assurance, one of our clients that couldn't make it. Uh, I'm not going to try and deliver their presentation because I would make a horrible job of that. So I am going to talk about something slightly different. The title's a little strange, right? An echo in the silo. What, uh, what does that mean? But it's really about the pitfalls of managing identity and access management for today's hybrid enterprise. Um, and when I say hybrid, I mean specifically cloud, mobile, and enterprise computing. The world that we see most of our clients living in today, one that is a composite of all three. So let's start with a little bit of history. We always like to take a step back and say, where did we come from? And if you look at the first generation of identity management uh, solutions, and I myself was part of a company that was definitely in that wave at Waveset Technologies. In fact, we even use the word wave for Waveset. Um, where identity management really evolved at a time of change in infrastructure. Uh, those of you that were, that were in security or identity, it wouldn't have been called identity around that time, around, say, 90, about 90, 98, 99, 2000, uh, when it was user management. You know, who puts how I did, I'm, I'm in user management, that used to be the title. We saw a lot of change, right? We moved from mainframe through distributed and into the web. And the challenge of, of managing uh, identity through that was obviously significant and the response from the industry and the tools that we provided was really around IT automation. So we took tools that were designed for the IT user, that were designed to, we often say, crank the handle faster, uh, get people created in account sources, 
uh, in a more automated uh, manner. These were very much standalone tools. Uh, and the processes that they uh, instrumented weren't really very well integrated with the business. They were, as we say, IT tools for IT technicians. And as Kurt just very uh, eloquently explained, we've come a long way. Right? As an industry, uh, we've certainly been pioneering the idea that governance at the center of identity is absolutely important. Or more interestingly, identity is at the center of security, which is uh, even more interesting. And we really moved to this notion of identity governance and administration. And what we are all really after here is a single point of visibility, management, and control. So we understood that the name of the game was to bring data together, understand the relationships in that data, and then actually give us a means of managing and controlling it in a better way. Uh, it was something that was definitely built for the business user. Uh, the, the person we anticipate sitting in front of the web console for solutions in identity today is definitely the business user. And as it says, you know, really an integrated part of the application and business process. This isn't just designed to be a standalone tool. It's designed to be something that people are using in an integrated way as part of their daily life. Um, the focus really moved and is today on desired state modeling. Very, I'm the CTO, so I can be techie, I guess, but we, we like to talk about desired state modeling, right? Because that's what we're really trying to do. Understand how things should look so we can observe them against how they do look and we can take action based on the delta between the two. And that really means putting in place many things that Kurt alluded to, sustainable controls and governance, things like recertification based on risk scoring, things like preventative and detective policy controls. And so that really became the state of the union. And I would really say this is kind of where we all are uh, in an industry as vendors uh, today. But infrastructure change is coming again. It's accelerating, in fact, at a faster rate than I think any of us have seen before. Distribution is happening at a very, very fast pace, driven by cloud and mobile and by the um, breaking up of the data center. We're really seeing a change that's, that we've got to deal with once again. The user expectations have certainly changed. The user experience, as we like to think of it, is now an all-time high. People want usability. They want high access. They want to go to your iPhone. You want to do a password reset from your iPhone off network. That's the expectation. Why can't I do that? How hard is it? That's the kind of user expectation that's really moved. But at the same time, we're being demanded, as all of you are, to do this in a more simple way, which can lead to greater cost reduction uh, as a mandatory part of the program. So this is a great deal of pressure. Uh, unfortunately, what we've seen in the industry is a development or kind of a, a reversion back to uh, standalone identity management silos. It's kind of creeping back. We took it out of all those individual disparate systems and centralized it in that modern uh, generation of identity uh, governance and administration. But what we now see is a range of standalone solutions that have identity management based within them. Things like platform specific IAM tools, a, a tool that's just for SharePoint, for example, that just does user administration and user management from SharePoint. It's hurting, it's painful, we need a tool, we'll go get a standalone tool for it. It might be uh, Cloud ITSM, the eye's gone from TSM. Cloud ITSM, anyone here a ServiceNow user? A few there. IT service management from the cloud has been a huge push. It comes from all the things we said, faster, simpler, better. Uh, big drive there, does ITSM do identity? It kind of does little bits of identity. We see it within, anyone here using a mobile device management platform to manage the mobile distribution? As you start looking, a couple of hands there, but as you start looking at uh, MDM platforms, they kind of come with identity. They kind of do their own version of identity. They really, really are a silo. And the same for cloud-only IDAS solutions. We've seen an emergence of, of identity management as a service solutions that basically provide single sign-on only, or they do it just for cloud apps. So these silos are basically coming back, individual identity management tools by infrastructure type. And it's kind of strange to see that we're kind of almost taking steps backwards. We're almost refragmenting and re-isolating IAM in its processes and its practices, right? And this kind of, as a technologist, it's very strange. It's this uh, reliving the past that we're going through. And so we say there's kind of an echo 
in those silos. If you go talk to the people that are deploying MDM standalone, or they're deploying an ITSM, large-scale ITSA, IT service management uh, product and process, and they're embedding identity in it, it's kind of like words to the past, questions that we've heard so many times before. The questions that drove us to create products in identity governance administration are being asked again. How do I provide full lifecycle management for this account? How do I provide a single point of end user self-service? I don't want my users to just do something within the MDM solution. I want them to be able to go one place for all of their user and identity management capabilities. And how do I implement audit, governance, and compliance? How do I get these higher level go uh, governance and control uh, capabilities to apply across the silo? And the question is, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult. And so it's kind of, it's deja vu. Uh, I find it very, very strange that uh, I've, been in user administration for the last 16 or more years. It's kind of all I've ever done, really. And it's like I keep hearing the same thing. It's like, didn't we solve that problem already? Didn't we fix that? Didn't we have preventative controls before you could provision that were the same controls that you had when they're detective? Haven't we been there before? And it seems like we're in a time warp. And it seems like some of the new generation of IDAS cloud-only solutions have kind of forgotten everything that we've learned. They do it standalone, in a silo, without integration, without alignment, without consistent policy. And it's kind of strange. Uh, you know, we kind of say that it has to be integrated. I mean, that's the purpose, right? The identity today, to me, represents the single thread that attaches everything about the identity. And as we move more into cloud, it is the one thing that ties you together, the user's profile, the user's, the true identity that ties it together. So it has to be integrated, and it has to be comprehensive, and it has to be business-driven, and it has to be compliant. So we've got to be smart here. As we move to manage our identity in the cloud and across the mobile environment, and when we try and apply some of the things that Kurt showed around general thinking of identity governance, um, an administration, and we apply it to those, we've got to avoid the pitfalls of the past. We can't repeat the same mistakes, or I'm gonna shoot myself, because I've seen this far too many times. So there are some simple things here, very simple things. In fact, four things that we would say are the common pitfalls. The first is the belief that cloud apps are just different. We don't need to manage them the same way, and I'll go into each of these in a little more detail. The second is that my mobile device management solution can be deployed standalone. It's just doing MDM. It's not integrated. Doesn't need to be. The third is that ITSM, IT service management, as a service, does identity already. So that's, we'll do it there. And the fourth is that identity management as a service is all unicorns and glitter. It's surely the easiest thing to do. It's just, we'll put it in the cloud to manage the cloud. So let's just take a quick moment to drill into each of these and give a little, in, a little view into how we see that as a, a pitfall and how we think you can avoid it. So number one, cloud apps are just different. I would be, sh I'm shocked the number of times I still hear that today. Oh, my, my cloud apps aren't SOX relevant. Or my, I don't need uh, join a mover lever controls on my SaaS apps. Uh, and that happens in the business mainly. And there are a lot of common misunderstandings around the business. The first is that, as I say, cloud apps aren't compliance relevant. You know, what I need, it's just a, it's just a minor app, but it has personal data in it. It has often SOX relevant data within it. Another one is that it's always being managed with departmental level. They, they manage our salesforce.com access at the regional departmental level. We've seen over the years, it never works that way. It isn't, a it isn't a complete closed loop process for provisioning and deprovisioning. And then people sort of say, well, it's not really my problem, is it? Well, it absolutely is. And we'll talk about some of the ways we get around it. On the technical side, I know at so this conference we're mainly uh, identity technical people, there's some very common myths here too. The first I hear, particularly being at a single sign-on focused uh, uh, conference, is that SSO fixes all this. All I'll do is I'll put a single sign-on layer in front of the app and I'm done, right? Maybe I'll do just-in-time provisioning on the backside. I'm done, right? And the truth is it doesn't fix it. It doesn't fix the problem for the cloud app, and it certainly doesn't fix it for a governance and compliance view on those applications. The other thing we hear is, well, the cloud apps don't have provisioning APIs, so there's not a lot we can do about it. Well, that is becoming less and less true. 
Uh, those of you who were here for the pre-conference tutorial would have seen um, a presentation from one of our guys on SKIM, Simple Cloud Identity Management. The vendors, the SaaS app vendors are adopting this as a standard. There are programmatic APIs in those applications, so we can manage them just like any other. And the third is that account level provisioning is okay. There are products on the market today that create the same account for every single person in the cloud. It's deja vu. That's, I mean, that's pre-1999. That's what automated provisioning was here to do, fine-grained provisioning. Everybody needs a different access. And so these things can be fairly easily avoided because cloud apps aren't, they're just apps, right? They're just, they're just not running in my data center, which to some degree means I've got to show more control. And so fixing the missing, misunderstanding of the business is very easy. Uh, cloud apps are compliance relevant. Uh, they are very rarely reliably and, and holistically managed um, at the departmental level. And so it really is the, the business's quest, question and problem, and it's your question and problem as a technologist, because ultimately they're going to ask you for the solution. And avoiding the technical um, mistakes is pretty easy too. Accounts need provisioning and deprovisioning. If you do single sign-on into, for example, salesforce.com, what's at the back of it? An account. That account needs to be created and deprovisioned through the API. That's how you make it compliant. There are APIs that exist, and these applications picking on Salesforce have super, super fine-grained permission models, and so you've got to do fine-grained provisioning. It's easy enough to do. Whether your identity governance administration applications are running either as an identity uh, as a service solution or on-prem, they can connect to both of these sets of infrastructure. Uh, this isn't rocket science, it's just a connector to an app. The second pitfall is around MDM deployed standalone. We see this quite frequently. It's a different group of people in a separate group that basically deploy and are responsible for the mobile device management solution. And these solutions are very, very device centric. They're not very identity centric. They're about managing a device. They very loosely associate it to an account and they certainly don't associate it to an identity. And that can be a problem, especially when they're not integrated with holistic IAM centralized processes. So we quite often see a lot of MDM solutions connecting directly to AD and having a direct sync agent sitting on AD and managing that user's accounts by virtue of propagation from Active Directory. And the worst part about this is using that AD sync account propagation technology in a unsafe, unsecure, unmanaged way. So we see people using group overloading. There's a group in AD that's called ABC123. If I put you in that group, some sync agent's gonna pick you up, gonna send you into the MDM cloud application, and it's gonna start provisioning. It's very abstracted. It's very unmanaged, and it's really outside of business oversight and controls, and that can be a real problem. So to fix it, and avoid that pitfall, it's quite simple. Connect your identity governance and administration solutions, your provisioning, to those MDM applications. They have APIs. Be a client. Demand that your vendor, as our clients did, as our customers did, provide integration to MDM so as that you can attach your join and move a lever life cycles to it. So the, the goal being integrated visibility and control and so as we can look at some of these normalized use cases for device onboarding, for identity account propagation, for entitlements and profiles, so as you can see the information when you look at an identity and understand who somebody is. And this is really building integrated controls. So you can review and certify devices and content in line with the rest of the join and move and leave a cycle. So when someone leaves, you wipe their device. Very simple to do. The third pitfall is this view that IT service management as a service does identity. There was a surprisingly small number of hands in the room when I said ServiceNow. There are a lot of ServiceNow deployments in place. Um, trouble ticketing from the cloud is a very, very obvious first cloud service that many have gone to. A number of vendors there that provide it. But the biggest problem we see there is that the ITSM guys really don't get identity. They're kind of, you know, it's this how hard can it be? Thing. We'll, we'll literally write a script for that. So they don't come to the identity management group and say, hey, well, we, you know, we have a request here. We're going to provision some infrastructure, and we need to create a root account. They don't come to the identity platform and say, you provision that account for me in a compliant way. They just write a script. 
So we see a lot of audit failures and the, the account from, from uh, un, unknown and unmanaged privileged accounts, and they're actually being created by scripts from ITSM solutions. It's kind of strange, right? There's a separation and then a conflict there. And there's a lack of integration and clear direction both from the IT service management tool vendors and from, to be honest, from the industry at large in how to do it. They desire to own the glass for everything IT. And they don't integrate with the, ITSM, with the uh, IAM fulfillment back end. And they provide a toolkit. So what do technical people do when you give them a toolkit? They use it. They write solutions, right? They write, they kind of rewrite identity management. And it's strange to do. So again, the solution looks very, avoiding that is very, sounds very similar, right? Bi-directional integration. Again, these platforms have APIs. Let's integrate them. Uh, the goal really is to get to that sustainable visibility and controls layer and standardize, standardize the integration use cases. So as that we can do request fulfillment, I'll try and use this thing. Yeah. So we can do request fulfillment that starts at the single point of glass in IT, IT service management and is then sent as an API REST call to the IGA platform to have the provisioning happening. This isn't rocket science. The use cases are very easily normalized and standardized in products like ours so as that you can actually get to the specialization of identity staying in identity. So as that the identity management platform that you've put in place is still there to do the things that it does, which is fine-grained provisioning with controls and governance and preventative controls. Let's integrate these things to do, together in some intelligent ways. And I think a key part of that is, we say here, sharing approvals. We always in IGA talk a lot about dynamic and risk-based approvals and approval cycles. I got, if you've not been through this, these guys want to own approvals. That is their mission in life, is to, is to own workflow approval processes, because they want to do it for the desk, they want to do it for the phone, they want to do it for your badge access, and they want to do it for identity too. So the way you make that work is you have to release a little bit of control here. You have to let them talk to you as an API, and you have to interact on the approval flow. You can't be sort of dominant, administrative, and say, no, I'm going to do all that. You have to be very flexible to kind of bring them in and let them use you as a provisioning platform and a fulfillment layer for identity uh, within their infrastructure. Huge, huge, I, I'm really surprised we don't see more on this from the analyst community, giving clear direction on integrating these two things together because it's, uh, it can be a, uh, an area of great, great pain and misunderstanding for, for, many, for many customers. The fourth, it's kind of a little silly, I guess there's kids at this conference, so I wanted to have a unicorn. There's none of them here, but anyway. Um, the other thing is, now, I can say this because uh, Cellpoint is both uh, an on-prem. We are recognized by many as the leader, the innovation and deployment leader in identity governance and administration. So on-prem, identity management, done right, that's what we do. We also have an IDAS solution. So we have a complete identity management as a service solution that provides single sign-on, governance, provisioning, uh, the, the full life cycle. So I don't say this out of, uh, out of uh, a lack of, uh, of uh, ownership over that side of the market. But one another thing we see in this space is this idea that IDAS is all, it's all good things. It's all unicorns and glitter. You know, it's the panacea for cloud apps. And so you, I, I've heard a number of times, oh, it's all in the cloud, so I'll go buy an IDAS solution. I'm kind of wrestling with Oracle. There's no Oracle people here, so I can get on their case. I'm wrestling with an Oracle project and have been for the last five or six years. I can't get anything done. I'm not going to spend any more time with it. I'm just going to go buy an IDAS solution standalone. I'm going to, just for my cloud apps. I'm going to buy it divisionally in the line of business. I'm going to create a silo. Deja vu. It's kind of, the, it's not the right approach. These things have to be integrated. So. Single sign-on, just-in-time provisioning is something you'll hear a lot about from my dad. Say, oh, we do just-in-time provisioning. Uh, that's all you need, right? Well, you know, just cloud resources. All I'm going to do is the cloud and AD. That's enough, right? That's going to get me through where I need to be. There's also a number of issues here around deployment and connectivity uh, models that some solutions provide. Being firewall-friendly is very, very important. Imagine you're, putting your, you're moving your identity management process from on-prem and all that, act, all that capability and you're putting it in the cloud. It's got to get through the firewall 
to some point of presence to provision and connect and do things. Doing that in a firewall-friendly way, we see a lot of issues there. Creating open firewall ports, non-response times of under 200 uh, milliseconds. If you want to do integrated Windows authentication from the cloud, you've got to be able to talk to AD in a, response, in a request response model in less than 200 milliseconds. So that can be a real challenge, and they see that as a failing point for some solutions. Uh, this, back to this AD group overloading. We see some simple, very simplistic cloud IDAS solutions. All they do is overload AD groups. They kind of say, you can manage it all from AD. You just create some groups, and we sync them all. We sync people out of those groups and send it up to the cloud, and it all, it's, all, you know, it's all unicorns and glitter. It just, it just works. Those models are very, very brittle, and they very rarely support fine-grained provisioning which is absolutely table stakes, even for our cloud applications. So the solution there is to choose an IDAS uh, solution that's done it right. I'm going to say that, of course. And that means, first of all, that single sign-on, password management, certification, and real provisioning are required. Uh, doing just one piece of the pie is not going to get you where you need to be. It has to have built-in governance and compliance. Again, that's not deja vu. Let's not just go creating accounts without approvals, without fine-grained provisioning, and without all of the things that we've come to learn to understand and that means governance and compliance for identity. And this idea that, to some degree, you have to accept that you're trading customization for reduced cost and increased time to value. The first uh, identity management in the cloud solutions are obviously going to tailor towards simplification. That's the kind of the purpose. If you're looking for endless amounts of configurability and endless amounts of complex process capability, that's probably not the right place to go. And we're quite plain and honest and open with our clients about that. And that is, it's kind of, IDAS represents for me identity done my way. I mean literally my way. <laughs> right? We design the product, we, we get it to fit a certain way that you should manage identity, and then we give it to you cheaper, faster, and better. That's really, really the point. And coming back to that connectivity layer, look very closely at how that on-prem connectivity is done. Because overloading a set of AD groups is not going to work. It's not going to work over time. We've all seen what happens to AD when it's left to do its own thing. It has to be firewall friendly, it has to be secure, and it can't be tied to those static AD groups. You have to have logic, and it has to be done within the governance platform itself. And then importantly, a full enterprise connectivity set is required. I don't know about you guys, but we've got more. Than, we're only a 350-person company. We've got more than AD on-prem. So we absolutely require, let me go back, sorry, that this gateway, which is on-prem, so we have our identity management functionality running in the cloud, connecting over a secure um, uh, uh, outbound SSL channel to a managed virtual appliance that has within it the potential to connect to 80 different internal applications, the kind of enterprise apps that have to be there for it to be complete, compliant, um, and comprehensive. So in summary, Avoiding pitfall number one, which is cloud apps are different. It's quite simple. Cloud apps aren't that different. They're just apps, and we have to manage them with exactly the same level of diligence that we would any other application. You can fail an audit on Salesforce just as easy as you can on SAP. Avoiding pitfall number two, MDM being deployed standalone, is quite simple. We should be, shouldn't be deployed standalone. It should be integrated with our IGA processes. They have an API. We know how to talk to it. You should demand it as part of the deployment planning for those MDM platforms as you start to roll them out. Avoiding pitfall number three, again, pretty easy. Identity service, ITSM as a service doing identity. You just have to make sure you open a very strong dialogue with your ITSM groups and make them realize that IGA functionality is there to be a fulfillment layer for provisioning and is easily integrated with all of the service request management and uh, help desk password reset capabilities um, that they're after. And then avoiding pitfall number four, IDAS is all unicorns and glitter. It just, it really isn't. But if you look for the right capabilities and you look for the right solutions that meet the full need of identity governance and administration, and you deploy them in a considered way where you're prepared to trade 
delivery simplification for simplicity and less cost, they can be very, very effective. So I'll finish with Mr. George Santayana's famous quote, those who can't remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So it's essential that we remember where we've come from, we keep in mind everything that we've learned in identity governance administration and apply it equally to the management of both mobile and cloud and enterprise in one cycle of control. With that, that was my 25 minutes. This little red uh, Dalek-like uh, thing is flashing at me. So that means we've got, we do have five minutes if anyone's got any questions. I'd be happy to take any questions or, as Kurt said, we'll both be around at the end of the track here and uh, happy to have direct conversation. A question at the front. What are table stains? <laughs> you got me there. Is that not a, that's not a US colloquialism? Uh, table stakes are the bare minimum heads. You know, it's got to be on, the, it would be like a napkin, like a, a serviette. You know, it would have to be on the table. It's the base minimum requirements. Gee, you know, I've been here 20 years. You'd have thought I'd know. I, I come across, really, that you don't say table stakes? Damn. Oh, the Doctor Who thing on the, yeah, the, I'm going to pick that up and go Dalek, Dalek, yeah. I'm sorry, if you'd have thought I'd been here 20 years, I would have learned these words, but you know, it's like I still call it a lorry, not a truck, so. Great, well, thank you for coming, thank you for listening.